Hello and welcome to The Actor and the Engineer. My name is Paul James. I am the actor. And my name is Josh Knapp and my technology always works. So <laughs> Paul's got a little, a little bit, some new technology he's working with. And so we're working through a couple things, but it, it's going to happen. This podcast is going to happen. Come hell or high water. One of my favorite Wait. movies of the last decade. Hey. Don't start with me. Don't, I'm in a really good mood. Don't ruin it, okay? Don't start with me. That is a really highly praised movie for you and only you. You're right. Why? I, There's a thousand more movies that you're, you could be picking on. Why Why that one? I have a history with that movie. And the same thing with Mad Max Fury Road. I know everybody loves that movie, but like I just can't. It's hard for me to get on board with that movie. It has all the, all the ingredients. I just... I got... Weird pacing issues with that movie. If you have nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all. It's a golden rule. Stop bagging on hell or high water, especially out of the blue. Anyway, I will I will say this. I have new technology, and like Magneto, how he can manipulate metal, technology seems to go awry around me. I don't know if it's something just in my nature, in my psyche, in my physical ability, but my X-Men power is I break everything that has to do with electronics. So I just got new earbuds. I just got a new phone. I'm getting a new iPad. Woo! 2021 yeah. has hit Paul James. Thank God. But who knows at this point? Well, on a, on a much happier note for everyone, Steven Soderbergh came out with his list fairly recently. He does this at the beginning of every year. He keeps track of not only every movie that he's watched throughout the previous year, but also every book that he's read, every short story that he's read, every play that he's watched, TV shows, all of it. So I don't do that. I just keep track of my movies and I catalog them through letterbox.com. And my name is Mr. Sam Lowry, another reference to a movie, one of our favorite movies of the show. But I found some interesting intersections between his list and my list, weirdly enough, not just the movies that came out this, this past year, but there are there's a handful of movies that we both watched, and it's such a it, it runs the gamut. So here's a couple of of similarities: Rashomon, Jaws, Maltese Falcon, Citizen Kane. Makes sense, you know. These are great movies, and it's like, oh well, you know, maybe in a year you probably you might watch each of those once every year. But then there's other ones like Hunt for Red October, uh, The Red Shoes, Escape from Alcatraz, which we did a podcast including that, The Wicker Man, the 1973 version, Gilda. Dirty Dancing, The Hitchcock's Notorious, and of course, Die Hard right around Christmas. Oh, and Ace in the Hole, the Billy Wilder movie. I also watched that this year too. I got a Criterion version of that. First of all, the guy, I don't know how many movies he watched. I didn't literally count each one, but way more than me. And I watched 174 movies last year. That's a decent amount. I do like going back over my movies and figuring out. It's a good place any place you can go to that that you can put movies you want to watch and you can catalog movies that you have watched, it's pretty cool. And Letterbox is actually pretty nice. So you need to get on that, man, so other people can see what you're watching. I just got a new phone. I just got an iPad. I just got an earbud. Come on, dude. <laughs> it's going to take me to 2040 in order to get on Letterbox. You're right. I should. You're right. It's yeah. interesting because you are a list and you are an organized person like that. I am a list person, and but for whatever reason, I'm just not organized like that. I can't put two and two together. Like when we download a podcast, I should go right on Facebook and post it. I mm. don't for whatever reason. I wait till like two or three and then I scurry and do it. I've been taking care of my dad for the last couple of years and I've been writing down everything that he's eaten over the last three years. And um, just because I'm a mono eater, I'll eat tuna fish salad sandwiches every day and just completely forget that there's another person eating too. So I always write it down. That's where it started. But then it started because of health reasons and all the above. I'm about that. I just don't know why I can't go from watching something to, you know, putting it down. I don't know why. Just one of those things. And crazy enough, a lot of those things on that list, I also watched The Hunt for the Red October. That's the first time I've ever seen it. Other than Sean Connery and his Scottish accent, instead of having a Russian accent, other than that, it's a pretty well done movie. It's very well done. Yeah. And everything that happens at the end is how you want it to happen. It's extremely well done. I did not see Jaws this year, though. Mm. I did not see it this summer or the beginning of the summer. It came out in 4K. Oh, yeah, I know. I heard. What's that like? Oh, my gosh. It looks, it looks amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's I mean, yeah, it's obviously shot on film. And so there's there's still, a, you know, film grain associated with it and all that stuff. But it just the it, it looks actually the first scene in the movie where, you know, it's day for night. It, it's it's a weird feeling because that they, they shot it during the day and then they make it seem like it's at night by just lowering the stops in the camera 
to make it seem like it's darker but you can really see a lot in in that first scene and obviously the rest of the film is i don't think it took away from anything as far as like sometimes older movies you you get especially scary movies from the 70s well we talked about it in the wicker man where it just has this dirty feel to it and that makes those things even more scary and mm. i didn't get the feeling that by making jaws look better, crisper, cleaner, a better transfer, that it lost any of its tension or lost any of its amazing blockbuster quality. Well, I'll close all this out by saying that if you want to go check out Steven Soderbergh's, his actual year in review, then uh, his website is extension765.com and you can find it from there. But yeah, he's go- he goes back at least the last five years that he's been doing this. So it's really, really cool. All right. Well, so today we're talking about a new film. It's uh, available on Amazon Prime. And in 2019, I think it, it debuted at some uh, film festivals and it was supposed to come out this year in theaters. And I think maybe it did come out in a few, but most people are probably going to see it on Amazon Prime. And it's called Sound of Metal. It's a movie about an addict who's now sober. He's a heavy metal drummer. He's on tour with his bandmate, girlfriend, and suddenly he loses his hearing. He spends some time in a rehab deaf community, and he's learning what it's like to be deaf, but he's also kind of holding out hope that he can scrape up enough money to get cochlear implants and rejoin his girlfriend on tour. So stars Riz Ahmed, and he plays the the drummer Ruben. His girlfriend is played by Olivia Cook, and... There's a couple of supporting actors in this movie. One has gotten a lot of attention for Oscar potential. Uh, and I think his name is pronounced Paul Rocky, but it could be wrong. I looked it up. They said it's just like the word racy. Maybe I heard somebody say it incorrectly because I've not heard him say it. And I've, I've listened to multiple interviews and everybody's like, hey, Paul, how's it going? It's like, thanks, guys. Yeah, I, they do that all the time. I look up people's names because I'm the worst. I listen to a thousand things and not one of them say his last name. Yeah. First of all, you're not on first names with this guy. Mm. You're interviewing him. Yeah. That's like a professional like job thing. You just don't call somebody Bob. Um, but... I think it's racy. Either way, I was super into this movie to begin with. Number one, I play drums. Number two, I'm so interested in how sound is integrated into film. And it seems like a lot of movies don't take advantage of the potential of sound and sound design. And I knew from the beginning that sound design was going to be integral to the telling of this story. So I was really excited about watching this movie. How about you? How did you come across this movie? Well, I remember seeing a trailer a while ago for it. And um, I was re-watching Girls on HBO. And I'd seen like the first three seasons. And now that I have it on demand and HBO Max, I can catch up on these shows. Riz Ahmed has a guest starring role at, I think it's the end of the, well, the fifth season into the sixth season, if I'm not mistaken. And he's really a standout. And I remember thinking to myself, hey, isn't that that guy from Sound of Metal? And then you have not been able to turn on anything about the Oscars without seeing his name. And so that's kind of how I came to it. I remember hearing his name, knowing who, I I know who he is, but if a picture came up and somebody said, is this his name and put his name underneath it, I would be able to say yes or no to that, but I probably couldn't say, oh, it's Riz Ahmed. That said, it's interesting how things come to people in this world. I've seen him for a while now Mm -hmm. in films. He's all over the place. But for whatever reason, it was girls and then this that made me go, oh, that's Riz Ahmed. So I've been meaning to get around to it, but I just have it. And after watching the first five minutes, I knew why it took me a while to get around to it because it was going to captivate me. And it did. And if I get through this podcast without crying, it's because I have practiced this whole day (laughs) not to cry about this movie because that's all I did. His performance is so heartfelt and so touching and we can get into it, but that's how I came to it. Yeah. So it's, it's crazy. This, the kind of formation of this movie, it was inspired by Darius Martyr's friend and co-writer of A Place Beyond the Pines, Derek Cianfrance, who has directed multiple movies, multiple ones with Ryan Gosling, actually. He directed Blue Valentine. He directed A Place Beyond the Pines. And and he also directed The Light Between Oceans with Michael Fassbender and Alicia Vikander, which I have not seen, but it kind of seems like a tough sit. But yeah, so when they were together writing Place Beyond the Pines, Derek Cianfrance 
told Darius Martyr some stories about how he used to be a metal drummer and how he started getting hearing loss during his Mm. performances and after the performances. And he realized that he had to quit playing drums if he wanted to keep whatever hearing he had left. So they kind of got together and said, well, you know, this is actually a story. And simultaneous to all of that, Derek C. in France was shooting footage of a band, Gussifer. So uh, there's all this footage that nothing ever came of it. And so kind of putting all those things together, the the director of this movie, Sound of Metal, went to see in France and said like, hey, I'm going to go forward with this. And so he developed the whole movie with his brother and him and his brother, Abraham Martyr, wrote the film. So it's kind of an interesting development process, kind of based on real life, but then also going into a different direction, especially once they get into the rehab area. So yeah, I I think we need to address the performances in this movie. I think there's some really powerful performances. I wanted to start with Olivia Cook because she doesn't have very much screen Mm. time and she's able to kind of like walk this line And we can't get into like the end of the movie, but I'm more like interested in the beginning of the movie. And yeah, so I wanted to get your feeling of of her. Uh Uh-oh, he's already starting to look away. Yeah, yeah, I I was trying to hold on, man, because as soon as you said it, I flashed on to the scene that gets me, and it's almost 20 seconds long, if that long, is the second time you see them playing together after he has realized that his hearing is going. It's after he has been to the doctor, and then they play that night. And he's not wearing monitors in his ears, by the way. He is the first two times you see him. I rewatched it to make sure I was right about that, which I find fascinating because one of the themes of the film is it doesn't matter why, it is what it is, so what do you do with it? For me, at least, that's one of the themes. I don't know if that's an actual theme, but that's what I took from it. When he first, he gets frustrated in that scene and goes outside and she follows him outside. And it's the first time that he says, I can't hear you. But of course it's muffled in that masterful sound design where it would sound like what he's hearing. And the look on his face when he has to admit that to her, geez, geez. <laughs> it's um genuine and organic and real. And it happened in that moment. And what he's feeling in that moment I felt in that moment and the way she reacts and all she says is what it's masterful. It's 20 seconds long, if that long, and then it clips to the next scene. And in that just 20 seconds, you know more about them as two people together than you would need an hour's worth of dialogue explaining their relationship. It's mesmerizing and she is mesmerizing and she doesn't have a lot to do in this film. And unfortunately, because the category is so stacked this year, which is a good thing, supporting actress, she will probably not get recognized as all the way up to the Oscars. She has been recognized in a few awards at this point. As supporting actress? Yes, as supporting actress. That makes sense. Yeah. If, if they had a, yeah, if they had a cameo, although it's more than a cameo, it's a, without her character, the movie cannot proceed. It just can't. Yeah. You know so much about them because of her and how she reacts to the news of him losing his hearing. So to do so much and so little, in my opinion, is way more impressive than having Ma Rainey's Black Bottom long monologues. Mm -hmm. Not that, of course, I said nothing bad about that. I mean, I loved those monologues, but to do it in one look or one expression or one word, explain four years of a relationship with just a what is talent, Mm -hmm. in my opinion. So I loved her. I, I was praying and hoping the first time I saw it, and it made sense that it would happen, but I was praying that she would come back at some point. And the way that the screenwriter and the director brought her back is just right. And how she handles that is just right because she's still the same person at the end as she was at the beginning because she didn't have as much to go through. She doesn't have as much to change. She doesn't have an arc to where she has to change or else. And that's what you learn with the main character. He has to accept where he's at or his life is never going to be the same. Well, it's never going to be the same anyway, but his life can be as great just in a different way. And without those first couple of scenes with Olivia Cook, you would never know that she was still kind of the same person at the end. And that's why what happens at the end is so important because Mm. she's still in one place, not waiting for him though. So it's masterful. I like the reveal of their, of how tied together, like you said, that they are, 
how their relationship is based in love, but it's also based in this kind of mutual, they are mutually dependent on each other to help each other get through difficult times that they've had in their past. And we find out that his sobriety coincides with him meeting her and starting to go out with her. He's been sober for four years and he's been going out with her for four years, not a coincidence. Also, we find out through a really great shot that that he is trying to wake her up close to the beginning there in the the airstream and her arm. I mean, it's just got you got light coming in through the window and she's laying there just like naturally, but you can see that her arm is uncovered and that she has scars that that are that have been healed over of of her cutting herself sometime in the past. And I brought this up to Steph because we were we were watching it and and I, and I was like, that's the stuff that I look for in a movie. Like that's what gets me going. I know something about that character without you giving me a two minute monologue about, don't you remember five years ago when I used to cut myself? Like it's, it's a really important part of that character and it's integral in us understanding her character, his character, their relationship, but it doesn't have to be shoved down our throats. Similarly, we don't know he's an addict until they're sitting in that diner and she's calling his sponsor, his NA sponsor or AA sponsor, whichever one he's a part of. But you can tell that gives us the audience an information on, okay, yes, he's a recovering something and she's there to help him get through his stuff in the same way that he's there to help her get through her stuff and that they are together. And there's even that line that she says, right as she's leaving, he goes to a rehab. She can't be there with him while he's at the rehab. So she leaves in like an Uber or something. And she says to him, uh, essentially, if you hurt yourself, I hurt myself. His pain is also her pain because I guess alluding to the fact that her seeing him not be able to effectively and constructively deal with his situation, not being able to hear is causing her pain and causing her to have the urge to cut herself, scratch herself, do bodily harm to herself. And so her knowing that he's going to get help and get the help that he needs is going to help her to feel more confident that he's in a good place and that she can be in a good place because of that. It was said much more eloquently through pictures than I just did, but it, it was it was still uh, we were still able to get all that through through certain shots and and through just very simple one line pieces of dialogue. And I do I like the efficiency of the filmmaking that Darius Martyr is able to have. And I think that probably has a lot to do with writing the screenplay and then being able to to flesh things out. And it's a really, it's a really efficient screenplay and it's very well done. They're, they don't, they don't waste a lot of time getting him from place to place and thing to thing. And especially once he's at the the rehab and and starts to get involved in the school kids that he works with, things escalate quickly as far as his ability to to pick things up. And and there's not a lot of screen real estate spent on his brooding and all that <laughs> stuff. It moves forward quickly so that we can get to some really tough stuff later on. Yeah, I'm glad you intertwined that. I'm glad you brought up the point about film real estate because I knew you were. How efficient it is because you learn about where they've been by the posters in their mm-hmm. van. You learn about their lifestyle by how he cooks. You learn about what they drink, eat, all in a matter of um, a couple of seconds on film. And then that lends to something later on when he does lose his hearing. You don't hear the coffee pot uh, percolating oh, anymore. You don't so hear good. it dripping. Yeah, so good. And you know instantaneously that this guy is taking care of his life. It's counterintuitive to see a rock star, if you will, wake up, exercise, drink a smoothie that he knows he's going to hate and she's going to hate. As an audience member, you're going, why is he doing all this? I guess maybe life on the road is hard, but you come to find out very quickly because you're right. They do not waste time in this film. And the only review that I read of Sound of Metal that was kind of not into it as much as everything everybody else was, they said they wanted to know why he, how long had he been suffering from hearing loss? Did it just happen overnight? Is he had these problems? Why? How long did he suffer as an addict? How, they wanted all that stuff filled in. I was like, no, that's missing the point of this movie. Yeah. The point of this movie is not about what happened in the past. It's about how he moves through the present with what happened in the past and what he's hoping will happen in the future. It's a very in the moment film. And that I think is hard to do and they do it really well. And you also notice that 
when you see the cuts on her arm, she also has a rash. And he goes, how, does, how is that? Is that okay? And she's like, yeah, it's fine. And she's kind of scratching at it. And he's like, oh, yeah, you want to stop that. And that leads to something that happens at the end of the film with mm. them too. Yep. That's the key scene for the, at the end of the film. But yeah. Yeah. No spoilers. But when you're watching it in the beginning of the film, <laughs> well, let's just go into spoiler Okay, that's land. fine. Yeah, yeah. Anything from now on. Yeah. But I, I love the movie just period. I, I thought it was, it was great. So I've seen it twice so far. Uh, me too. Uh, 100% on the same page. Spoilers from now on. But we, we're doing good. And there's nothing major that you can be told about this movie that will ruin the experience. If the experience yeah. clicks for you, it will just continue to click. You you don't need to, even if you know the ending, I wouldn't want to know the ending. Although it's not mm. like, like this big reveal. It's just the way the movie should have ended. But I never put together that rash in the beginning was what they were talking about at the end. I just didn't put that together until the second time I saw the film. I, it just seemed like an insignificant thing. So not only does the director and the screenwriter happen to be both brother and then the stories by uh, Cyan Friends, not only are they efficient about what they put on screen, but they're also really good at just telling what you're supposed to know as if it's not significant, but it is all significant. Everything you see in the beginning of the first 20 minutes of this film all plays into things that happen later on. So I find it amazing that you can not only limit what you show people, but you trust your audience and the people who are going to be enveloped in this film to just know what you're talking about. You know, people are not dumb. Audiences are smart. They're savvy. So the whole like dialogue thing about why she cuts herself or why he's an alcoholic or why he's a drug addict. It's just not necessary in this film because you're right. What happens in the middle to last part of this beginning of the third act is way more important than anything that needs to happen in the beginning. So yeah. there's something that stuck out to me. We talked about Riz Ahmed a little bit, but I, I want to talk about Paul Racy. We are introduced to him when they show up at the rehab. And uh, Paul Racy is an interesting actor in that he is the son of deaf parents. He's a former addict. He's a veteran. And he's the front man for a Black Sabbath cover band called Hands of Doom who performs with American Sign Language while they sing and play and all that stuff. And it seems like he's an advocate for the deaf community and he can hear. So th that's where the, I guess there's a difference between him in the movie and him in real life, but it's very similar to the character that was written in the screenplay. So, I mean, it seems like a, kind of an amazing coming together of, of forces to get him in, into this role. And he does not disappoint. We, we talk about it all the time. He's one of those actors who just doesn't have to try. Like, it's just like that naturalistic acting. and it feels genuine as opposed to line readings and all that stuff. You, you could feel an authenticity and it probably has some to do with his experiences in life up to this point, getting this role. But then also it has to do with him being able to, to take a character and take lines and imbue them with truth and with reality and get that to come across to the audience. It's a great performance. I agree with everything you said straight down the line. I don't really even have that much to add to it other than whatever he is, I wish that I had more of and I strive for that. And I think I can achieve it on some level, but there's such a naturalistic uh, force behind his performance. I keep using the word organic, but that's mm. truly the word. He is 100% embodied in that character. And I actually think having all those things similar and maybe they revamped the character to fit that. I'm not mm. sure. I don't know if the character came first and he, I mean, if it was the character was on the page and they found Ooh. that guy, I mean, how could you, <laughs> what, how could you not cast him? Especially as good as he probably read for it or as well as he read for it, I guess is the proper English. I think it would be harder to be yourself versus have some strong character choice, mm. like having the obstacle of losing your hearing. Not that Riz Ahmed had a easy time at all on any level because he learned to play the drums and he learned sign language and he did it in eight months. Mm. And I actually think the perseverance and the strength behind sticking to something for eight or nine months out of your year to learn it just for this insignificant amount of time on film is probably what brought him so centered to the role. Yeah. But back to Paul Racy, he is one accolade after the next, after the next. He's on everybody's best supporting actor list. They're calling for an Oscar nomination. And at first I thought, 
it's going to be a shame if people don't understand the power behind his performance, because a lot of people are going to be like, well, what exactly did he do to deserve, deserve an Oscar nomination? And it's just like Mahershala Ali in Moonlight. When you are so genuine and so real, I think that's 10 times harder than having a physical handicap or having something that you can connect to as an obstacle, which can lead you down the path. All you have is words. And Paul Racy doesn't make breakfast, doesn't build an airplane. He doesn't like work on a puzzle. He's not doing anything during his scenes, except for talking, mm. usually across the table. I mean, at the beginning of the film, it's at the, the cars and that kind of stuff. But other than that, he doesn't do a lot of moving around. And a lot of acting for me is action. An actor in motion seems to be more believable. You're you know, wiping things down, you're peeling an apple, whatever it very well may be. Sometimes when I'm lost, I will be like, can I like clean that cup? Can I do those dishes in that sink? Sure. And it gives you an obstacle to work against and it makes it that much easier to be in the moment. Paul Racy has none of those things to do. He just has dialogue. And if you break it down and you watch that final scene that he's in, that is so powerful. Oh my. The more and more I think about it, it's that moment was meant to be played by those two guys in this film and only those two guys, because only Paul Racy could have played that scene the way that he does. And, the, and then credit to the director. He doesn't pull away. When Riz Ahmed leaves the room, he doesn't pull away. And I'm so happy because a lot of directors would have pulled away and ended the scene abruptly. He doesn't. He holds it there. And I think it's because of what Paul Racy's doing. So mm -hmm. I'm glad that everybody's re recognizing Paul Racy. I just hope that people don't think that that was easy to do because the lines in that last scene that he has, if you were to read them, you might think they're kind of cheesy. You know, when he's talking about in the silence and sitting still and that's where God is and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe in everything he said is the truth. I believe what he is saying, that stillness and quiet is a superpower. It's a strength. Now, I have a little bit of a problem with how quick they expect this guy to adapt to that. <laughs> that I have a little bit of a problem with because, you know, he's a rock and roll star and he's playing music his whole entire life and his whole life is based on hearing. So you kind of have to give him a little bit of a break. But Joe knows that he's been doing this long enough that if he cuts anybody a break and gives anybody a little bit of leeway on the rules, it doesn't work because the bottom line is, God is in the stillness. God is in the silence. And I would ask anybody who doesn't understand the power of what Paul Racy did to go and just read that dialogue as words and see how difficult that would be to pull off. And man, does he pull it off. Whatever comes out of him at that moment, I was tearing up all the way from the very beginning. I told you in the first two minutes <laughs> when they look at each other, when he has that scene when uh, he first goes to the rehab and he's reading the screen, Riz yeah. Ahmed is reading the screen for the first time. Oh my God, it's so devastating. It's so devastating. The realization that he has to read words and can't hear them is devastating. And the way that Joe stays very professional and very to the point, but also kind of eases him into it in, in the way that he presents himself. It, it's not overbearing what he's asking him to do. So I, I just think that there are things that people might underestimate how easy this stuff would be to do. And I'm telling you, it is not. To be that genuine and that in the moment, in that last scene that Joe and Ruben have, and to not overplay it, and to not become all teary-eyed and is really hard to do. And I'm asking the movie gods for two minutes of that in my life. <laughs> That's why I'm so impressed with Olivia Cook because she's not in this movie a lot, but she does her job and no one can fault her. Yeah, there's a lot in that last scene uh, that the, the Joe character is on screen. And it made me think of how many times has he had to have a conversation like that with someone who he's trying to help with someone who's in the scenario. We're seeing this once from Ruben's standpoint, but how many times has he had to go through this? And in a lot of ways, he's kind of like he does have a military background, the character in the movie lost his hearing in Vietnam and then subsequently lost his family when he came home and started to drink to try to cope with it and then wasn't able to cope with it by drinking and then had to come to the point where his purpose in life is running this rehab. So there, I'm sure that there have been other people to come through the rehab who've had similar outlooks on new hearing loss and, and how to cope with that. And so I just, that to me was him looking back and much like in the military, like if you're entrusted with a platoon or a squad or, or a company or whatever, you need to watch out for your whole company. And if there's someone who's going to be a detriment to 
the group, you have to have the group's well-being in mind and something like that, someone who is antithetical to your focus and, and to your mission as a group, that person has to be let go at, at some point. This is also before Ruben has the cochlear implants turned on. So that's a whole nother thing. We, we do need to get into cochlear implants because that's one problem I have with this movie. It's not necessarily Ruben helping himself. It's that Ruben has to adhere to the philosophy of that facility in order to help himself. And then somebody also wrote, how hard would it be for a savior to turn to a person who needs to be saved and say, I can't help you. And if you look at it that way, and since the God imagery was brought into it, it's easier to look at that that way for me. If you're looking at Paul Racy, Joe's character as a savior to people who are coming in, not literally, just as mm-hmm. a word more than anything, how, how difficult would it be for a savior to have to turn their back on somebody yeah. because they're not willing to save themselves yeah. or not adhere to the philosophy of saving themselves? And that that's why that scene is so well done because it's not necessarily about letting Ruben go. It's also about Joe having to let Ruben go. Yeah. That's, and I think there's an affection that grew between them two very quickly that I'm not saying that Joe doesn't have that affection for all of his people. I'm not saying he doesn't have an affection. Of course he does because he's been in their shoes and he's walked in their shoes so he understands. But there's something about Ruben that is, there's something that shines in him. Even in the middle of this tragedy, there's something that shines in him. That's why the young boy takes to him. That's why he takes to the young boy. That's why the teacher takes to him. That's why people take to him. They gravitate to him. And so I'm sure Joe did on some level. And I'm thinking to myself, Joe probably had that conversation in his head at one point. I hope Ruben makes this. Mm. I hope he makes it because I'm not going to be able to let him go. There's something special about him. I need to help him figure this out. And then when he can't, that must be devastating. And it's all in that one scene. Hashtag jealous actor. I think that the savior thing is a, is a bit of a fallacy. I think that you could consider Joe a conduit to, he, he's facilitating an ad- adaptation to a new reality. So he's trying to get people to understand that this is your life and, and, and this is how you can move forward in your life and how being deaf is not a limitation. Being deaf is a reality. So that's, and, and that's just, I mean, and that's, that's kind of his whole thing. But another thing what you're talking about was him saying, I can't help you. I don't think that he was necessarily meaning, I can't help you. He was just meaning like, I can't do it the way that you want to do it. So he's hoping that by rejecting Ruben's methodology is that Ruben's going to hopefully at some point come to the reality that, that he can still live a fulfilled life. And I think by the end of the movie, he takes one more step closer to that. Let me clarify something. Savior is a word that we're associating with a a Christian meaning, if you will. But if you look at the definition of savior, it says a person who rescues another from harm, danger, or loss, especially to oneself. So I understand why somebody used that term. I don't think Joe would ever call himself a savior. It's just that word by definition means that he just wants to help somebody save themselves from themselves. And on that definition alone... If that's your job and you can't do it, that must be so hard Mm. to let somebody go because you can't help them do that. You can only show them the way. And so that must be really difficult. And the more and more we talk about it, the more and more I understand why the actor was so entrenched in that scene. Because just having us talk about it for the last 15 minutes and the pressure and the amount of power that somebody has in that position is immense. And power in a good way, not a mm-hmm. bad way. Because of course, absolute power corrupts absolutely. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the power somebody has to show somebody a better life. There's a strength in that. So to not be able to do that is why Paul Racy and Joe react the way in that scene. And it's so beautiful. And I hope that's the scene they show at the Oscars. I hope they don't stray away from that because sometimes they are like, we're not going to show you the best scene. We're going to show you some dumb. Here, hold my dog. (laughs) Yeah, here. Yeah, right. Oh, up the stairs. Thanks. Okay, so we want to stay. Don't do that. Show the scene. Show the scene. Because one, if you're not touched by that scene, Mm -hmm. then I don't know. I don't understand. And two, even if you have seen the movie, it's. It's not going to ruin anything if you haven't seen the movie. It's only going to enhance it because you're going to want to know why that scene even occurs. So would you call me a prognosticator? I am seeing into the future. That is the scene they will show. And I hope they show the very end of it where the director holds on them and that's it. That's what I hope they show. 
because that's beautiful. I think we need to nerd out a little bit on the uh, sound design. <laughs> I, I kind of knew we were going to get some really cool stuff coming in here, but I did really enjoy how they would smash back and forth, especially after he loses his hearing, how he experiences the world and then how the world is around him, how they kind of like go back and forth between those two. One of the greatest scenes to kind of point out how a deaf community experiences something just like a, a dinner table was amazing where, where he's sitting at a dinner table and all we hear is these muted thuds every once in a while. And then it just seems like there's a flurry of activity, but all you hear is just kind of like a few little sounds and then it'll cut to what the actual table sounds like to someone who is, is able to hear. And it is just a cacophony of noise and it's people having cross table conversations with each other. And I mean, they're not having to shout or anything, but that's why they're slamming on the table to get somebody's attention to be like, Hey, I've got something I want to talk to you about, or, you know, kind of going back and forth and teasing each other and all of that. And, and much in the same way that we see the difference between his being able to hear when making breakfast and him not being able to hear making breakfast, that pair of a, of a scene. We also get the same pair of scenes with the dinner table before he knows sign language and the dinner table after he knows sign language and how it's just a complete 180. They're teasing each other back and forth. We're able to kind of see that interaction that he's a part of. He's become a part of that community. And it's not because he, you know, it's because that he's bought into the fact that that learning sign language is going to be beneficial to him and it's going to give him the ability to interact with other people much in the same way that he interacted with people before he lost his hearing. So I thought that was such a cool, another cool pair of scenes that we get to see and a great use of sound design. I agree. We started this podcast with all this new technology that I am getting and or I've received and my I got a new phone and when I first watched this, I watched it on my old phone. And I think I'm glad about that because I put my headsets on and I took them off because I couldn't deal with how real it sounded to be going deaf and I couldn't handle it. And so I took them off and I watched it. And my old phone, now that I'm hearing my new phone and all this new technology, it sounds almost mono compared to my new phone. Everything's mashed together. And I think it saved me. Because I don't think I could have watched this movie originally with these high-tech earbuds and these this great sound system and all. I couldn't do it because it's too overpowering to hear what it sounds like when he has that buzzing, the tendonitis or whatever it's called. Tinnitus. Yeah, tinnitus, right. Which I actually had a year or two ago. No, actually like three years ago. It was when I went to go to New York to see the 30th anniversary of U2's The Joshua Tree oh show. Gosh. I know, I was so worried. And it just happened to be fluid and it happened to be sitting on my, my eardrum or wherever and it was ringing. And it was fine. The concert was spectacular and it didn't do anything. I was worried about that though. So maybe I was a, it was a little too close for comfort. But then once I got to watch it with my new earbuds. And I realized, did you notice that the there was a shot of an airplane going across the sky and the sound goes from one side of your ear all the way through your middle of your head to the right, left side of your ear. And it goes across the screen and it goes from one side to the next. And I think that for me, what I took from that is I don't know what the director meant. And I don't even know why the scene's in it. And I don't know why they designed the sound like that. For me, though, it made me realize how much I don't take for granted my hearing. I don't take it for granted because I feel blessed that I could hear that, recognize it, and make it part of an artistic journey through this film. Now, I'm not saying that my life would be, it would be different if I couldn't hear. But I've never felt like I've taken that for granted. You know, I've gotten to go to one of the biggest bands in the world's 30th anniversary and finally hear one of my favorite songs that I have never heard in 30 plus years of seeing them <laughs> tour. I got to see it that night and it was spectacular and it was so beautiful and it was so crisp and clear. And the idea that this movie gently pressures you into hearing these sounds the way that they need for you to hear them made me realize I don't take my hearing for granted, that I am blessed that I can hear these things. Things, not meaning actually hear them, but they they resonate with me uh, as if something to take in it. And it's an art form. And this is why when people discuss awards and statues and self-congratulations, this is why these things exist for me. 
because these guys, whoever they are, need to be recognized. Somebody needs to say their name out loud because what they did was make us hear and then not hear and then understand this world. And if it wasn't the way that it was, would the end of the movie be as impactful? I don't think it would. And you're right. There are interesting things like at that dinner table when you hear the, the way that it vibrates, the way the knife vibrates on the table when mm. the person's tapping on the uh, plate, the way that the knock sounds. And then that great, I loved this movie, <laughs> the scene with the young boy who gets bored during the dance thing and yep. they go out and he's got his ear on the so beautiful yeah. it's so beautiful yeah god it's and they the boy never moves and then you see ruben starting to drum out a beat and then he you know taps it out and then he taps it out and then it starts to be like this serious like you know almost like the song in the beginning that they're playing with the two bass drums or i guess maybe it's one bass drum i'm not sure how many bass drums he has he definitely has a double bass drum yeah like the do, 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 yeah that, the heavy yeah. metal thing that happens with the double bass drum yeah i love that so there's a supervising sound editor his name's nicholas becker but there's also a sound editor and her name is maria carolina santana caraballo Gremko. So yeah, that's a, that, I just wanted to say that name. That's like five names. People better get used to saying that name. They better practice because that name is going to come up again and again and again and yeah. again. So would she be the one who, I, I, cause I know there's sound, sound editing, sound mixing, and I get confused about what that really means. They've combined them in the Oscars now. There's, they're the same now, but I think that it's kind of like mastering a song and mixing a song, how they're different. When you mix a song, you determine like how high the bass drum needs to be in this particular song, or, oh, the lead guitar needs to be a little bit quieter. And, and so that's what the mixer does. And once the mixer determines all of that, they package it up and they send that flat recorded file to the next person who's the mastering engineer. And the mastering engineer uses an equalizer to say like, okay, I think high frequencies in this portion of the song need to be accentuated. And I think, you know, the mid range needs to be pulled down at, at this point in, in the chorus and that kind of stuff. That's what a mastering engineer does. I think similarly, you have a sound mixer who says like, how loud does the horn honking need to be in this traffic scene? Okay, we're going to set it to here. And that's what the sound mixer does. Whereas the sound designer will be able to goose certain things. They're not like, specifically picking which bell you use when a little kid goes by in a bike and they ring their bell. They're not determining that. They're just kind of figuring out overall how intense the mix needs to be at this point or how subdued it needs to be at this point. So uh, you could have one person do all of that, but I think there's some people that are better at certain parts and certain people that are better at others. So, but that's my understanding of it. And because, yeah. and because a knife doesn't sound like a knife on a plate in a film, when you're trying to record it, you have a Foley artist who recreate that and they might use a fork and a knife in a plate, or they might use something that completely doesn't, it's not a fork and a knife to make sure. the sound of a knife in a plate. So this sound department, all of those people need to get Oscars, <laughs> every single one of them. They should, because this movie would have been good if they had only fulfilled their job 50% and didn't do what they did. But this movie is great mm. because of the sound mixing, editing, Foley artist, the sound department. Yeah. The whole film works because of the choices. Now, granted, a director can go in and say, no, I don't like that. Or yes, I do like that. Or what's your idea on this? So it does fall on the director to say, hey, that's a great idea. And I'm sure it works just like I've seen it work in my small little professional world of acting where somebody comes up with an idea and it's usually like three ideas and they present it to the director and the director goes, oh, I love that. I didn't even think of that. Oh, that's great. Let's go with that. You know, costume designers, that kind of stuff. They have production meetings where they all come up with a general idea, some specific ideas, and then they go out and they do their thing and then they bring them back and they get approval from the director. And a lot of times, like I just said, the idea that the Foley artist comes up with is a much better idea than the director had in his mind. And so it sounds to me like the sound department knew exactly what they needed and wanted. And so I'm sure the director had some mm -hmm. input into it. But it sounds to me like they just knew this was the way that was going to work. And it works. You know, because how does a person know what a deaf person hears? How can you describe that? Yeah. But whatever they came up with made me feel like I knew what it was like to go deaf. Yeah. And it was scary. And then 
exhilarating mm-hmm. and then fulfilling. <laughs> so they did their yeah. job. And and we should definitely talk about the cochlear implants uh, too, because that's a whole nother layer to this sound design. And first of all, nobody would ever have gone through what the Ruben character went through in this movie, where they go in, they decide that they want cochlear implants. They don't know anything about them. And somebody says, sure, give me forty to $80,000. And then he says, okay. And then the he goes into surgery. And then afterwards... They're like, oh yeah, it's you're not going to hear for another four weeks. He would have gone through like a big, huge preamble of here's what you can expect. This is what the timeline is. This is what you need to understand. This is who needs to pick you up from the hospital. The, 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 it never would have happened like this. So th- that's the whole like movie situation that facilitates the story that the director <laughs> and writer wanted to tell. Fine. But I would hope that people didn't get some sort of like, why would anybody ever get cochlear implants? Because I think for some people, especially younger people, are able to to really get a benefit from cochlear implants and that may be right for them. But other people, it may not be right for them. But in his situation, they're right. You have to completely, it's it's like losing the ability to control your legs and then learning to walk again with a limited ability to control your legs. You're literally learning how to hear again. So the thing that you used to hear, if it was, I, I don't know, a trumpet, it's not going to sound like a trumpet anymore. It's just not. You're going to have to correlate old trumpet sound with new trumpet sound. And you're going to have to understand that that's what a trumpet sounds like now. And it's not going to sound any different. So yes, they have modifications, capabilities to make different changes, but it's not this sort of magic bullet that's going to make everything go back to normal. But yeah, it makes good fodder for really crazy sound design. And I mean, the best use of that is hearing Lou, his girlfriend and her dad singing, and then it very slowly morphing into morphing from some beautiful thing that we hear that we can really appreciate as an audience to the reality of what he's hearing. And it just breaks you when you see his face and when you see him realize that he's not going to experience music in the same way ever again. And that's just like, I, that is one of my craziest fears that, that, and like, well, I mean, all of my senses, but primarily hearing and sight. And that's one reason why I don't have LASIK. Most of Seth's family has gotten LASIK surgery. Steph will not get LASIK. I will not get LASIK. There's this this crazy thing about people shooting lasers into my eyes. Like if I don't have to have somebody shoot a laser into my eye, I don't want somebody to shoot a laser into my eye. But you know, it's very safe and I understand. And you know, there's anecdotal evidence, uh, you know, that, that says that everything's going to be fine. But for me, I just, and that's another reason, just so it happens I need glasses. Well, guess what? I've got a thing in front of my eyes all the time. So it's like I've got safety goggles on all the time. I totally have like a certain amount of fear of losing my hearing and losing my sight. I mean, of course, I, I'd deal with it if I did, but uh, I just, I can't imagine not being able to hear music again. That's just, that would just crush me. Can you imagine getting, and I know I said earbuds a thousand times, but they're new to me. Can you imagine <laughs> getting these and... Hearing this music, because I've listened to a thousand things over the last couple of days yeah. that I haven't listened. I listened to Purple Rain by Prince all the way through. When's the last time you've heard that <laughs> album with such great, oh my God, it's brilliant. It's so brilliant. I've listened to a thousand different things. I, I was obsessed with Jay-Z's Blueprint 3. I listened mm-hmm. to that again. They, him and Kanye did an album called Watch the Throne. I listened to that again. And just to hear it in such crystal clear and the bass is back, I can hear the bass line in all the songs and U2 is heavy bass. <laughs> yeah. And really that's the talented one. Adam Clayton is the talented one in wow. U2. Without him, they couldn't do all of the chink ching ching things and the whoa things that they do without his laying down of these incredible bass lines. I mean, they're fantastic. So imagine not being able to, after hearing this, not hearing any of it. I can't. But that said, I don't take it for granted. I am thankful that I can hear and that this music is in my life and that I got to go back and explore these albums mm-hmm. I haven't listened to in a while, and I'm, I'm grateful for it. I think your, your take on the implants and his understanding of it, I think you're missing a, a little bit of a point, though, that's made in the beginning of the film when he first goes to the rehab. He learns all the rules and regulations of the rehab, but never really takes them in. He never really lives by them. He does a survival thing where he learns American Sign Language or ASL because he has to and because it's part of this program. But does he ever really buy into it? No, he doesn't because he would be going to the computer and breaking into that room yeah. to make contact with his girlfriend, which of course you know in a 30-day program, 
you're not allowed to make contact like that. There's specific times you're, you can make contact when you go to rehab. And sometimes depending on how severe your condition is or your disease is, you can't make contact at all. Mm. So that's part of the learning to be something that you're not at this moment. But he doesn't, he goes into survival mode and he knows all the rules and regulations and yet breaks them anyway. So my assumption would be because the film real estate, one of your favorite terms, which I love, is so precise in this movie. Maybe it's a thing where the director doesn't need to show you that he went and learned all this stuff about these implants and you just don't know he did it because he's going to hear, no pun intended, what he wants to hear anyway. The cochlear implants are about expectation. Just like going to rehab for him was about expectation. His expectation was do this, get back with his girl, do this here again. He's not listening to the middle ground of what the expectations are versus what his desired result is. Mm. And because the film is so precise in what it shows you and doesn't show you, if you only hear what he's supposed to do, and he's supposed to go every morning and sit in a room and sit in silence, sit with just himself. And if he has any thoughts, he writes them down. Mm. In that scene where he smashes the donut and what makes- mm, He puts it back together again. Yes, and mm. then smashes it again, but you don't see it, which I think is brilliant. That's a brilliant, choice because that's exactly what a human being in that situation would do. He is not learning from that experience. He's mm -hmm. doing that experience because that's what he was told to do. He will have to come to it at his own time. That's the motif of the movie. That's the, the theme of the movie for mm -hmm. me. Your expectations in life are not what you're going to get, but what you get can be just as beautiful, if not more beautiful than what your expectations were. So I don't think that kind of technicality bothered me at all. And I also think that I don't feel like it's necessarily a bad thing about cochlear implants or saying that they're a bad thing. I think for this character in this film at this moment, it turned out to be not a good thing because what he really needed was to sit in his silence, yeah. was to sit still. There's a superpower. There is God in that moment. That's what Joe says. And we needed to get to that moment. So even if the cochlear implants worked to the point where he could live a life of hearing, finger quotes, I don't think that the film sets you up for glorifying that or making it a bad thing. I mean, I guess it's each person's experience is different. So I don't think that they, they looked over something to make a movie moment happen. I think it's in the film that they justified. The question I have is this. When he first loses his hearing, he goes to the pharmacist who sets him up with a doctor immediately, which to me is a little like movie magic because who gets to go to a doctor from a An pharmacist? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. yeah I, that's definitely fictionalized in my opinion because, you know, you have to wait four weeks for anything. But anyway, I joke, but when... He goes to that doctor and he puts those headsets on. The way the doctor is talking to him sounds a lot clearer than when he gets the cochlear implants put in. So why can't they just use that technology that the doctor on the headphones uses for him to hear and just... I think that there's certain frequencies that he may be able to hear a, a certain amount of, but you're not going to be able to go through the world and hear just those particular frequencies. You need to have the ability to hear a range of frequencies. And it, your brain is going to interpret them differently with a cochlear implant versus being able to hear sound waves coming through and pushing on your eardrum and that hitting the little hammer and all that stuff and it vibrating a membrane and, and then your brain interpreting that. So that, that is a, it's a totally different thing, but it would be very similar to learning sign language where in the same way that you have to correlate coffee cup with a particular hand movement, you have to correlate horn honking with whatever it sounds like in your head at that moment that the horn honked and it's not going to sound like it used to so it's just learning a new language but by the end of the film which which i think we should get into right now that that, that very last scene the lead up to that last scene is him hearing the the music and then him in bed with Lou and then him realizing that like you said earlier she's scratching at her arm and that is like the the key moment to the whole film where he realizes he is causing her harm. His presence is causing her harm. And he understands that while they were necessary for each other for the previous four years, and while they helped each other move forward and they developed this band and they loved each other, that it seems like what he's feeling at that moment is that 
the the most loving thing that he could do at that moment would be to separate himself from her and that would be the most beneficial thing for her even though it might not be what he wants at that moment but him him leaving that next morning and you get the feeling that he's not going to come back i mean he's got all this stuff with him obviously and that he's going to move on with his life and that she's going to move on with her life and that while their relationship was was beneficial and while their relationship was a loving relationship they've now moved into a different phase of their lives that may not mean that they're together all the time. So he's got that all rattling around in his brain. And then he just has the bells from the cathedral and the kids playing and the cars going by. And that's where he's able to figure out that he can physically separate himself from that stuff that's going on by taking those cochlear implants out. And it seems like the first time that he's willing to really sit in that silence so it's it's a really powerful thing i mean when it dipped to black at the end i told steph i was like oh whoa i was not i was not expecting it to do what it did i was not expecting the film to to end like that i was expecting some sort of like clean button but it is it is the right way to end the film and that's what steph said she was like she was like how's are they gonna end it and i'm like well you're right you're right they can't end it any other way but I was, you're just, you, you feel like there's going to be something else and there, there isn't. And, and that's enough. So yeah, it's awesome. No, I didn't feel like there was anything else. And I felt like that was enough. And I felt like it ended exactly how it should have. And that's where that airplane scene, by the way, yeah. is um, where it goes across the sky. And so I also think that it's important to notice some physical changes you know she has a different hairstyle and a different hair color yeah her eyebrows are are normal back to her normal yeah 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 which i think she looks awesome in the beginning though she looks like she looks exactly how i love it i love when people find a way to be who they are through a physical expression and they are more so who they are with bleached blonde eyebrows than they ever were with dark brown eyebrows Mm -hmm. For me, it just seems like who she was, and I love it. But I also like when people make bold choices like that. I've often said if I won the lottery, I would shave my hair into a mohawk and dye it deep purple. And I probably would because I've been saying that for a long time. Who's going to tell me no? And I just find people who have a way of expressing themselves physically powerful. And so the fact that she doesn't look like that anymore is definitely a change. I still think that she is still in the same place. And I think maybe she has progressed further past the relationship even before they broke up because she's the one who has to take off in the beginning. She has to leave him. So the strength that it took him a year or something to gather, she knew in a matter of a day she needed to get away from him to make sure he was going to be safe and that he was going to be solid and get healthy. And the fact that he was so obsessed with her at the end or so not obsessed, but you know, he was in love with her. And the fact that he was strong enough to walk away is what let him sit in his silence. But she was the finish line. Like she is his motivation yeah. throughout yeah. all that time. And you're right. The motivation throughout all the time, not paying attention to the rules, breaking the rules, getting to, to the point where he gets the cochlear implants just so that he can get back to be quote unquote normal and then go back on tour. Like that's the focus. Maybe she'll still love me if I can hear again. And if we can be on tour again and everything can be back to normal. Well, guess what? It's not normal anymore. Your your whole life has changed. So, and that's what Joe's trying to tell him, but he's not ready to listen. He's not ready to hear it at that point. You're right. He does that throughout the whole entire movie. Right. That's my point. So if he didn't hear some technicality about how the sound's going to sound different, it that's doesn't true. it doesn't wash me any any other way. Um, and the fact that he has to give up the idea of being with her the rest of his life, because that's all he's known that's kept him strong for the last four years. And I, I don't want to sound obsession. At, I don't want to say obsession as a bad thing, but you know, to the point where it motivated him enough to go all spend $40,000 or whatever yeah. he spends on the implant and, and do the things that he had to do in the rehab all to get to her. But the strength it must have taken for him to walk away from her, because at this point he's been away from her long enough for her to readjust and move past that if need be, because she's the first one to leave. Now, it must have been difficult for her to leave, and it's definitely on the screen that it takes her a lot to get into that that, that cab or that Uber. But she's done that. She's in a whole nother country Mm -hmm. by the time we see her again. And she's moved on to a degree. So the strength it must have taken for him to get up that morning and pack his bag and walk out the door must have been devastating. It must have been so hard because to be in love like that and to have to walk away, I I don't think having somebody walk away from you is any easier. Having somebody break your heart that you're 
fully in love with is not any easier if they walk away or if you walk away. I don't think it's easy on any level. As a matter of fact, I think it's one of the worst pains in this world. Being in love with somebody who's no longer in the same place you are, I think is probably the worst pain other than some kind of physical pain that I hope I never go through. Uh, physical pain, that is. To actually get up, pack your bags and leave is what gave him the strength to sit in his stillness at the end of the film without him realizing, and you're right, when he realizes she's starting to itch again, she's starting to get the rash again, he realizes that's a physical manifestation of the anxiety she has on some level towards him because mm -hmm. why did it come back? It came back because they're not meant to be. And I don't know if I believe in meant to be per se, but they're not meant to be now. And that's why I think the movie could have only ended the way that it ended because the triumph is not him walking away from her for her benefit. And for his benefit, the triumph is, I'm going to sit in my stillness. I'm going to do this. That said, I would like to say just a little side note, something I mentioned in the beginning. I do think, and maybe you're right, maybe a, a line when he's at the doctor's office, hey, hey, Ruben, we talked about yeah. this. Your hearing's not going to be the same. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, but, but that wouldn't work now that I think about it because he wouldn't have sold his Airstream and been like, hey, can I come back and buy it in four weeks? It's 10% more, you know, because the guy's like, I'll pay you $26,000 for it. And he's like, okay, I'll do this deal if you allow me to come back in four weeks and buy it back. It's like, how is he supposed to make money in four weeks if he wasn't even going to be able to hear for until four weeks later? And that's why he ends up, see, that's, it all falls apart. So it's definitely not, nobody told him that it was going to be four weeks for him to turn that on. Or if they did, he completely did not listen. So that's playing fast and loose with reality, but it's fine. And it causes a conflict in the film that he has to, to deal with. And it also is the impetus for that final scene with Joe, where he not only shows him that he has cochlear implants, but he actually asks him for money, which is, oof, that's rough. Well, that's why it's easy for me to believe in the, the theory that we're going on that he's not listening to anybody else, that he's not, he's not taking in yeah. what the information has been given to him because he would have, one, never asked him that, and two... He would have never pre-planned for, even if he heard the information, the, the screenplay is so tight and so well crafted that it's just a kind of fun thing to do to try to figure out where we could find holes in it because there's not any. I mean, yes, that thing that you're talking about is a little porous and can drip a little bit, but really not really <laughs> because it can be based on other things, but it's such a beautiful ending to a movie that I mean I was having an emotional roller coaster ride the whole entire time anyway but that's partially who I am but at the end I felt so satisfied so like yep yep and I kept thinking to myself okay don't say this immediately just wait just wait and after your hyperbolic conversation about how this is the greatest movie of all time and how I say stuff like that all the time. And you, you're not criticizing me of that, but I do do that a lot. I, I said to myself very quietly, so only I could hear it. This is one of the best movies of the year. It's going on my top 10 of the year. And watch out for Riz Ahmed. He could very easily win that Oscar. Mm. He will be nominated. And he could very, no pun intended, quietly win that Oscar. And then everybody... From this point on, after he wins, goes, of course he should have won. Did you see that movie? Did you see what he did? I mean, there is such an organic power in his performance. But now, openly, it's a week since I've seen the movie, seven or eight days since I've seen it. I've seen it twice. And I had the same emotional, the impact of it was the same emotionally the second time that I saw it. As a matter of fact, I almost stopped watching it a second time because I couldn't even get through that scene where he's typing the words the first time. I couldn't get through it. I was like, okay, wait, come on now. You, gotta, you have to have the rest of your day. You, you can't do this right now. But I, 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 I did it. And it's interesting to have the same emotional reaction to scene after scene that you had originally when you watch it. Because when you first watch it, it's all new. You don't know that that's coming. But to actually almost anticipate it and yet it happens anyway is a beautiful thing and I think it is one of the best movies of the year it will be on my top 10 list and I will not be surprised if Riz Ahmed wins the Oscar wow. I will not be surprised probably not my vote because I already have a favorite mm -hmm. but well I'm sure I'll get nominated so whatever they show in the however this Academy Awards is going to happen produced by Steven Soderbergh by the way that's going to be interesting makes sense but anyway I'm going to try my hand at prognostication now to I think that the scene that they will show is the scene where she leaves in the Uber and then he has to deal yep. with it and he's kind of like walking back yep. to the RV 
And then, yeah. Yep. Oh my goodness. Yep. When he says, you're my heart. Remember that? When he says, you're my heart, yep. that's where the scene's going to start. Yep. Absolutely. I wish I had said it, recorded it, <laughs> and now could play it as if, yeah. No, 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 no. I'm glad that you're on. That's exactly what I was getting ready to say. I okay. was getting ready to say, I hope the scene is when she's leaving. Because when he says that, and I, I'm wondering if that was scripted or if that was improv. I have no idea. It sounds so genuine and so real. It sounds like he just said it right then and there. Well, it was handheld. So it's not like it was on uh, Dolly or anything like that. That was a handheld shot. So what my guess is that they were just pretty much like, do the scene and then whatever happens, happens. And then they probably did it multiple times. That's what I was thinking about the second time I watched it is how do you do multiple takes of that? And then you're just like, okay, just do something different. Like how many times did he do that? And what it, cause he's like beating his chest and he's going through things physically and he's, and he can't hear anything and it's so new and it's just, his whole life is just an upheaval. How do you even give a director like multiple takes of something like that? It's gotta be so draining to to go through something like that. Maybe it's fun. I don't know, but it seems like it would be horrible. It's empowering. Huh. There's a power to it. It's empowering. I would venture to say that I've touched that ever so slightly in my small world, in my small fishbowl, to where I came out of it and I could look around at everybody in the rehearsal and I could tell that they were as affected by it as I was affected by doing it. And immediately something technically happened and we had to stop and we had to go back into it. And then I was really happy with myself because I found my way through it again. And was it exactly the same? No, it wasn't. But was the emotional center exactly the same? Yes. And literally afterwards, and it's funny because when you tell these stories, you're kind of tooting your own horn. And I understand that. And I understand how this can come across like that, but that's not where it feels like it's coming from, from me. After the second time of getting through it again, I actually physically heard somebody go oh, like, oh, like, Ugh, don't do that again. Like we're good. Let's, uh, I'm glad we technically get to move on. So I'm sure that a skilled actor with the talent that Riz Ahmed has probably was tired as hell after that day, but I'm sure it was, it was empowering on some level. And also the fact that you can actually go there when it's time to go there is also very powerful. And it's interesting that we're talking about this because just the other day, I was doing that same monologue I'm talking about and I had an emotional reaction to it. And I think I needed that. I think I needed a cathartic moment in my life because of the pressure of the world right now. And I was like, oh, I feel so much better. And I was like, wait a second, can I do that again? And I did it three more times in a row. Now granted, it's in a dark room down in my basement a uh, garage that's made into a room. My father's asleep. There's no one around. There's no cameras. There's no HD. There's nobody breathing next to me. There's no audience member sneezing or getting on their phone. None of that is happening. So it might be a, a well-kept environment where that's conducive to something like that. But the fact that I could do it three times, and I don't know if I could ever do it again, but it made me feel like I think if ever given the right opportunity, I might be able to go there Yeah. because wow. I feel like I can. And so, so it's powerful. You said that it was handheld and that probably they could have gone anywhere they wanted and things might have just, but the, the, the script is so precise everywhere else. I wouldn't say that it wasn't improv, but the fact that it might be scripted is even more powerful because if he got that emotion from the actual words and see, that's, I think is the key, the words, if it's well-written, it comes out of you. It just does. Mm. And so I don't want to know. I hope I never <laughs> yeah. know whether or not any of that was improv or not. You know, you downstairs in your basement doing the same scene and getting to the same level of emotionality. It sounds like to me kind of like, it's like the the acting equivalent of like maxing out. If you like, you're lifting weights and you're like, I'm going to figure out how many pounds I can lift once in a, a deadlift or a military press or whatever. It might not be something you do necessarily every day. But just the fact that you know that you can do it, it, it gives you that capability to know that like in the future, you're right, you have the ability to do that. You also talked about tooting your own horn. Well, I will toot a horn for you saying that Steph and I saw you in a perfect arrangement and you did have scenes on, you know, not, I mean, I was going to say on screen, you were on screen in my mind because you were in front of me, but in front of everyone on stage and there were singular scenes with you were being the only person on, on screen and you did hold the audience. And so that to me was kind of powerful being able to see you hold a full theater of people. And, and that's gotta be empowering too. You're right. So in a lot of ways, I think that you, there's a lot more risk on the theater side, but there's a lot more palpable 
interaction. Whereas on the film side, it's that he's acting to nobody. Like he's acting to like a camera operator and a bunch of people back in video village or whatever. So the interaction is a little bit different and it. And both of them have got to be, you've got to, have got to make you feel different as an actor. But like, I can imagine feeling that kind of power, like on stage, it's got to be, it's got to be pretty, pretty intense. So that's cool. It's about moments. It's not necessarily about playing to the audience or having the audience react or anything. Cause a lot of times I'm surprised about how the audience reacts. There was a moment in that play that you're referencing that they laughed at every night. And to the, I was just thinking about this last night too. I to this day, in this moment, don't have a clue why it was so funny. I have no, and all I can think of is was very truthful moment. I don't know if you remember the moment, but my wife and I are talking and the doorbell rings and I'm supposed to be sick and I have to lay down on the couch. Mm. And all I simply did was go, damn it. Every single night that got a laugh. I have no, I think it's just because it was truthful. Like I was so frustrated with the situation. And I remember being so scared of not being able to take my shoes off and put my shoes back on. And I was afraid the couch was going to break at one point. I was so scared of all those technical things that when I finally got to go, damn it. I think it was like for real. Yeah. Like I was saying it like I'm fried. And every single night, the first night it got a laugh. I was like, I don't get it. And it got one of those like laughs. And the laugh got bigger and then got smaller and then got bigger again and then got mm. smaller and smaller and smaller. And then you, the person would walk in to the scene and have to wait in order for the audience to stop yeah. because they were still doing these trickling laughing. And I think it's about truth. I think it comes mm. down to truth. Well, thank you for that, by the way. But I think it's about moments. I don't think Riz Ahmed is worried about who he's playing to per se in the village and the, the camera operator. I think he's focused on that moment. And that moment probably was so powerful that it didn't matter to him that he was in a basement at 10 o'clock in the evening and it was dark or he was in front of an HD camera or he was on stage, whatever. The difference for me is that if the moment is real, I don't care what it is, but there's instantaneous gratification mm. with the audience being in front of you. So if the opportunity never comes to me, the fact that I can feel it and the fact that I can watch Riz Ahmed do it and feel it is I will never take that for granted. I'm fortunate to be able to feel what he's feeling when he's going through it. And I don't know if it's exactly what he's feeling or if exactly what the character's feeling, but coming out of it a second time, I felt uplifted. I think his story has a happy ending. Oh, definitely. I think this movie, yeah, he, he, he learned. And I think that's the goal of the movie or yeah. the theme of the movie it, is that you have to, you have to move on. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's true. It's a, and we kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier, but usually a, a character arc in a film is, you know, you see a character move through, whether it's like, I, I don't know if it's the matrix and you've got Keanu, you know, who's like, well, I know Kung Fu, you know, it's like, he's learning things <laughs> as he gets accustomed to this new reality and he moves through to the point where he can fly by the end of the movie like that is his arc and and in this movie this character you know Ruben's arc is literally him going from not dealing with his situation to taking the first step in dealing with his situation he hasn't figured it all out he hasn't figured barely anything out I guess that's what I was getting to earlier when I told Steph, I was like, I, was, I didn't expect this movie to end like this because you would have thought if this was a, a movie of the week, here's what happens when you lose your hearing and here's how your life can end up. Like, that's not what this movie is. And Poofy is literally a guy fighting against reality for 99% of the movie and then the very last moment deciding to move forward. And that's really cool. Yeah, and I can't think too much about it because... <laughs> I've been good. You've been, I did you've good been during this good. podcast. I did. I, I, I felt it coming along and I thought, nope, I talked about it. I'm not going to do it. And the more and more I think about that blackout, the more and more, you know, his heart grew three times the size, yeah. you know, like at the end of the Grinch, my heart's already huge anyway. So it just is like my, my heart is filled. And this movie is most people are asking me, so w what is it about this movie that you like? And I say, I think you just need to experience it. It's you guys ask me all the time what I'm watching. You ask me what we're talking about on the podcast as if it's like some kind of recommendation for what you watch next. And in the last eight days, it's been Sound of Metal, Sound of Metal, Sound mm -hmm. of Metal. And the fact that this movie is named Sound of Metal, but it has nothing to do with heavy metal music. Yeah. It has to do the way with Sound of Metal sounds to him after the implants and what his world sounds like now. And I think it's more the sound of the slide because the slide is metal. Very cool. And so yeah. when he was, and when he pulls away and you can just hear the light 
thudding of the drumming on the sound of metal or what sound of metal sounds like to them now Mm -hmm. it's beautiful it's a beautiful movie Mm, yes all right well you can check us out on the web at actorandengineer.com you can go to facebook.com slash actor and engineer you can tweet us at actor engineer and you can find us on youtube if you just search actor and engineer podcast and we'll see you next time 